tell you guys. Fabulous. Thanks, Erin. Um, so our panelists today are Jackie, Diane, and Pooja, and I'll be moderating. So I just get to ask questions and learn from the best. Um, I would like us to start by just kind of sharing backgrounds and how we got into tech and I'll I'll answer this one, but then I'll, I'll try to stay out of it. Um, I come to tech from kind of a math and science background. Um, I got to college and then there were ways to use computers to do the things that I already wanted to do. Um, and then that kind of was a nice little on-ramp to um, now I'm a software engineer, which I really love. Uh, okay, so um, Jackie, Diane, Pooja, who wants to hop in first? I'll go ahead and hop in there. I'm already unmuted. Uh, my name is Diane Nash. I'm actually located in Virginia Beach, but I have the awesome privilege of working for Epon as a data engineer. Uh, my journey into tech um, was not quite the ramp up. Um, I got into college and I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and I luckily had a college advisor who uh, tried to deter me from pursuing this path because she said, oh, it's really difficult. A lot of people drop out. And long story short, um, the first information management class I took, I was just addicted and here we are today, so. Hey, I can hop on in and go next. Um, I grew up with computers like most of us. Uh, I used to love playing games on the computer, but more than just playing the games and solving puzzles while I was playing, I wanted to know how those games worked under the hood. What happened to make these games work? So that's what prompted me to take programming classes when I was in middle school and high school. And then I, I um, attended VCU uh, majoring in computer science uh, with a minor in mathematics, and I started working as a software engineer. Uh, it wasn't until I joined Epon that I transitioned over to becoming a full data engineer, and since then I've loved getting into the data, figuring out what data can do for a company, for our clients, and outside of work, I read a lot. <laughs> I know I mentioned that in my icebreaker, but I really do love to read books. Um, I can, I'm, I'm usually either reading or I also recently discovered a passion for cooking. So started doing that too. Hi, um, and my name's Jackie Sakura. Um, so I'm actually a product manager and I went to school for international business. And so my career kind of started in the business realm. Um, I went to work at a big bank and spent about eight or nine years there moving through various business roles. Um, so I was a business analyst, then I moved into more business management. And when I was in that role, there was a new application that business was starting to set up. And they asked me if I wanted to kind of move over and start acting as a product manager for that application. Uh, so that's actually how I moved into product management. Um, so I did that for a few years and that was more working with software engineers. And then when I moved over to Epon, I came over as a product manager. So now I'm working on an engagement with uh, a group of data engineers. Actually, I work with uh, Diane very closely. Uh, so now I'm kind of filling that PM, that technical product manager role um, with that team of data engineers. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Um, so I know y'all can already tell that this is going to be a great group to learn from tonight. Um, and you can see from our little yellow bubbles that we're across different practices at EPON. EPON is organized into practices, so we can kind of have communities of practice, communities of knowledge. Um, so my first question is, what is your favorite thing about the practice that you're in? And what's maybe one of the more challenging things about your practice? Maybe we can hear from data practice first. Yeah, so to start off, um, my favorite thing, like I mentioned earlier, is actually being able to get into the data. Uh, 
see what it does with my own eyes, if need be, like query it as soon as possible uh, when I start on a client engagement. The biggest challenge, of course, with data uh, is a lack of clarity on what the data sources actually are. Uh, and as well as if clients come in and they say, I don't know what I can do with my data, you kind of have to find it too. So it's kind of like a scavenger hunt built in sometimes. Absolutely. Just to piggyback off Pooja, the puzzle is absolutely the best part of doing this kind of work, solving that puzzle. But I'm finding that one of the biggest challenges anymore is that there's so many cool tools to use and then trying to figure out how to fit in and learn all of it is, is uh, definitely a challenge, but lucky one to have. Yeah, that's an awesome problem to have. Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, for product management, it's really kind of being involved with the teams that are building and creating the solution that you're driving towards, um, but also being that liaison almost between both working with the data engineers and the technology groups, as well as coordinating with some of those front end people, um, whether it's a design team or front end stakeholders, and actually seeing kind of it all come together in the middle to bring something to life. So I, I kind of like getting to see it from all sides. And there are no challenges in the product practice? Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> along with that, um, it does become challenging because working across so many different groups, there are a lot of different stakeholders that you interact with. So kind of managing stakeholders and expectations for everything you're doing and balancing in kind of the, the tech teams as well as your, your front end teams um and trying to keep moving things along um I, I would say that's probably the biggest the biggest challenge there's a lot of personalities involved but it's part of the fun too <laughs> that is for sure awesome thanks so much y'all um i've got one more question for everyone while we get started and then i'll come back to one for everyone at the end and you've got a few in the middle that are for specific folks um so one for everyone it is International Women's Day, so appropriately, what skills do you see women bringing to the table and particularly um, the workplace table and um, especially in the tech world? What, what do you see women bringing? Y'all are shy tonight, come on. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'll go ahead and say, um, I think one of the biggest strengths that we bring to the table, especially in tech, is as women, we really want, I find that we, we still feel very much the need to prove that we belong in these spaces and that we do have the knowledge to do this kind of work. And, um, you know, sometimes it comes, it's called imposter syndrome, um, whatever it may be, but I think as a result, it really encourages, a, it's such a good motivator to continue to learn, to do really good work, to um, always try to better yourself um, and, and really, really get, build the confidence that, that you do belong in these spaces and that you can do this. And it's, it's not just for the boys. I completely agree with Diane on the communication part. Um, and the determination part too, actually, um, having that determination to succeed, to be able to play with the boys on a level field. And also, I think communication is huge. I feel like any time that there's a woman on a team, I feel like the team flows better because we're pushing for communication. And uh, additionally, the one final point I want to bring up is creativity. I feel like we bring a different perspective, a fresh perspective to any team that there's a woman on that can help solve problems in a unique way. Yeah, I mean, to what Diane and Pooja said, communication is, is huge. And I, I think, you know, as women, we are very good at that. <laughs> um, so like really being able to connect different teams and have a clear understanding of whatever we might be working on um, in the workforce, uh, that communication is always key. And kind of along with 
at that. We also bring empathetic leadership. Um, so I think women are good with understanding what the different perspectives could be across the team or understanding where different groups are coming from and what they're working on or what their asks are across different deliverables. And I think that really helps kind of balance a fair atmosphere. Um, and again, I think it's something that women are exceptionally good at. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I totally agree with y'all on communication. And I think um, to kind of tie into Jackie's last point, part of that that I definitely think we bring is listening, because um, that's more than half of communication. And I think we do it really well with an empathetic ear. Uh, okay, next question. Um, this one will be for Diane and Jackie. I would love to hear about a relationship, maybe with a mentor, or with a mentee that you might have had um, that's kind of shaped your career? How did you identify that that relationship was important? And then how have you kept it strong as you may or may not see that person every day anymore? Um, the first mentor that I had who really shaped my career and really made it so that I could even have this career at all is my um, first information management professor, Dr. Anita Hollander at the University of Tennessee, go Vols. Um, she was incredibly intelligent, incredibly um, headstrong and industrious. And um, the academic world can tend to be somewhat of a boys club, much like the technical world. And all, you know, all of these things are, are shifting and changing and we're definitely making strides, but um, Back in the day when I was in college, <laughs> long ago, uh, it, it was still very much that. And she was really fighting her, she was, she was always really pushing and ultimately she became um, you know, head of the department and um, she really pushed for us as well. There was a really small group of us even going through these courses and ultimately it was just two chicks at the end. And, um, she had fought for us to still be able to have that class because the University of Tennessee, if there weren't you know a certain number of folks to take it, um, they weren't they were going to cancel the class. But she she really fought for us to to be able to round out all the hard work that we had done and really cap off the, um, those courses. So she was incredibly important to me. I still communicate with her today, you know, an email here and there, but. Um, she just really I try to emulate a lot of, of what she brought to the table. Don't always succeed, but I'm working on it. So yeah, my I don't know if I have like one specific person, but I get into this habit of like when I'm working, I look across the women that I see in the group and especially the women that are in leadership roles. And I kind of say, okay she's running the show people are listening to what she's saying you know she's taking action um so those are the types of people i tend to be drawn towards and i like to imitate the strong behaviors that they've introduced um and kind of follow and see what works for them and and do the same and see if i can apply that in my specific role um and i also try to build relationships with people in positions like that. Um, that way I can kind of learn from them, go to them for advice. Um, and again, I, I guess I keep in touch with people that I've been close with um, in the workplace in positions like that by just, I don't know, if I'm going through my day to day and I something random happens that reminds me of them, something like, I don't know, maybe they like reading and I saw a book that they would like or whatever it might be. Um, I'll just, I like sending a quick text and being like, oh, hey, thought of it, thought of you, something like that, just to, again, keep the relationship going, especially when it's, you know, you might not, not be working in the same company anymore. That's awesome. Thanks, y'all. And Diane, I'm very glad that um, although you had an advisor who did not believe in you, you had a professor who did and who really fought for y'all. That's really, really awesome. And I'm glad that she got you where you are today. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> awesome. Okay, now a couple of questions about consulting. That's the, the business that we are in. Um, so we go on to engagements with clients on projects. 
And when you are first hearing about a project, when you're getting ready to go on to one, how well do you really think your client knows what they're looking for? Um, and do you think they really know kind of what type of consulting they need? Maybe we can hear from Pooja first and then Jackie. Sure. So as is the standard answer in consulting, the answer for me is that it depends on the client. <laughs> so a client can come to you and I've seen them say one of two things. Either they have all the data and they don't know what to do with it, which is admittedly rare nowadays in this big data environment that we're in. Or they have an idea of what insights they can get from their data, but they're not sure how to most effectively do so. And in the prior case is where clients are often looking for a fully qualified data engineering team that can just come in, do the work, maybe do some knowledge transfer right before they roll off so that the client can stand on their own two feet once again. In the latter, clients are more looking for data engineers that can step in and propose viable solutions for the problems they're trying to solve. And I often find that that second experience has been the most fulfilling because on occasion I've been on a team where I'm pulling in new insights for data that the client didn't even know that they need. Sounds exciting. Yeah, that's, um, it's interesting that you said it depends because <laughs> I think there's two scenarios that I've seen, um, again, like coming in as a product manager of, one where a client might say, okay, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And then once you start on the engagement and you really start understanding the problems and understanding the situation in the organization that you've been brought into to help, um, you realize, okay, this actually, you thought you needed this, but we could also cover these to other areas and, and work on improving things there. So I think really once you get into the weeds is when you truly find out what the true problem is and what is actually needed. Um, so that's one. And then I've also noticed um, specific to product management is different organizations um, and especially in tech, uh, they think of a PM's roles and responsibilities very differently. Sometimes they might consider a product manager someone that's kind of helping organize a backlog or kind of, you know, leading scrub calls or doing those day to day activities. Um, or they might think of a product manager as a project manager and kind of just organizing everyone and, and keeping track of things. Um, and then there's other uh, definitions where a company might think a product manager would be defining the vision and kind of building a product um, from beginning to end. So it, it really depends on the organization, like how they view a product manager role. So I, I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, that's definitely a common thing that we hear and have to say is it depends when we get there. Uh, given that we do operate in that situation where we're not fully sure what it's gonna be before we get there, how do you prepare before you go to an engagement? Um, maybe you know a couple of details. What do you try to figure out? What do you try to learn before you arrive? Uh, maybe we can go Jackie and then Diane. Yeah, definitely. I um, And it's it's kind of similar to my last response in that, like. I like trying to understand the full problem first and really understanding the why of why we're doing something. Um, and that's hard. A lot of times when you start an engagement, you get thrown into the deep end and you want to start just actioning on deliverables and getting things done quickly, but that doesn't always work so well. Oh, and you have to kind of pause, take a step back and say, okay, well, what's the broader issue that we're trying to, to solve here? And that understanding that a lot of times helps you deliver whatever the more specific task is. Um, and I'd also say to help with that, I like meeting with different teams, so different stakeholders to also get their viewpoint of what the problem is or, or what the situation is with the project you've been brought into. Because again, understanding those different perspectives helps you kind of piece together what the true 
problem you're trying to solve is. Um, so that's kind of how I usually tackle it in the beginning. It sounds like you you can't really prepare beforehand. You have to kind of have your preparation phase right after you've gotten there. Yes. <laughs> and then you can kind of go forward. You have to be very agile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I have to highly um, emphasize Jackie saying, figure out the why before you just hit the ground running. Um, admittedly, you know, at, at my, my current client, you know, I was really excited. Uh, and I had just gotten back into data engineering. I had taken a little break for a while after my last position, um, just due to figuring out life. But so I was really excited to get back into it. I was really excited to, to be doing the work. And to tie in with this, I was so nervous about how well am I going to do? Can I do this? And I was like, I just got to make sure I get it done. And what I found is, if I pause for a second, maybe you don't, you know, when you find out the purpose, you can really find the better solution. Um, eventually we got there, we corrected, but um, so definitely to, to take a moment to ask the why, um, and in regards to asking questions, ask the most obvious ones even, um, because sometimes you'll get a surprise answer and, um, and it is best not to assume um, definitely going into a new client, like to read about them as much as possible, try to understand, you know, what does it seem like their trajectory, tra trajectory is, um, going to be, um, try to maybe get a sense of the culture a little bit. So, you know, how to maybe approach and talk to, um, the other folks you're going to be working with. Um, and then ultimately be excited, but be confident that, you were hired to do the work for a reason um, and that you have the capabilities and um, and then just take a deep breath and knock it out. Yeah, that deep breath is definitely a, a very important step in the process for me too. Awesome. Um, back to Jackie, I met you are working with Diane right now on a data project. And I'm curious, because I'm a software engineer, I'm curious uh, what it looks like to be a product manager for a data team, because that's two things that I don't know a lot about. What can you share with us? Yeah, um, and especially because I previously worked with teams of software engineers and then transitioned to working with team of data engineers, excellent data engineers, by the way, shout out to Diane. <laughs> um, it really is uh, quite different. And I, I would say one of the biggest differences, and it, it took me a second to realize this, um, but understanding who your stakeholders are. Um, so when working with data engineering teams, the stakeholders are typically internal folks at the company. So you might be, you're working with people who are data consumers. So a lot of times it might be a data analyst or data science team. Um, so really understanding that uh, is quite a big difference because the way they're, what their needs are for the data, the way they're looking at what the data engineering team is delivering is very different than if you were kind of building out a front end application that maybe you're reaching out to clients to get feedback or, or something along those lines. So understanding the stakeholders um, and the differences there, uh, I would say that's a, a pretty big one. Um, and also, again, with my product manager hat on, um, when it comes to prioritizing, I've noticed the work that the data engineering team does is quite different in that there's a lot of founda foundational work that they need to do to make sure that there's a sound infrastructure. Um, and that is key to making sure that they have time spent on completing those tax and tasks and delivering you know, new tools and different things for the data world. Um, and also there's a lot of ad hoc like support requests that the data engineering team support. So you might have various teams within the company reaching out to the data engineering team saying, I need da this data. Can you help me? Or can you make this quick change for my reporting or whatever it may be? Um, so 
those two items are, are a big part of what takes priority. Um, and then you also want to make sure you can introduce new data strategies and maybe some exciting things like real time data, those kind of buzzwords. Um, focus on some of that work. Um, but again, I think for other engineering teams, it might be a little different where those new strategies might be a higher priority um, because they're coming from, you know, the, the top of the house business down. Whereas it's important from the data perspective to make sure you have that set up in a good spot and there needs to be time dedicated to that. So the, uh, the prioritization and, and what work is focused on um, is a bit different. That definitely clears up the picture for me. So thanks for that. All right, we've got another one for everyone. A very open question. So I'm very excited to hear what y'all have to share. Being a woman in tech, as we've talked a little bit about, and also as a consultant, which we've talked a little bit about, what do you want to share? <laughs> any advice, any nuggets? I'll go ahead and, and kick this one off. Uh, if I haven't made my theme clear is be confident. <laughs> um, and even if you're not sure about something, Google is a great tool and, and, you know, be confident, ask the questions. It can be really scary sometimes. And it can be scary too. And uh, I know personally, sometimes I've, I've sat in that, in that zoom chat and I realized oh, wow, I am the only woman in here. And all of a sudden I have piled all this pressure on myself to, to perform for all the women in the whole tech world. Um, but that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is, is to, to do the best work that you can um, and be confident that it is good because, because you care. Um, that would be a big one. And I wanna circle back to the, to the mentor piece and, you know, mentor doesn't always have to be someone who is is older than you or, or you know a lot more experienced. A mentor can be someone who who makes you feel um, you know safe in what you're doing, makes you feel safe to ask questions, encourages you to continue to learn and speak up for yourself. Um, and so I think finding those people in in your in your groups like women who code, you know your coworker. Um, uh, maybe it's your roommate who who sat in during COVID with you and you both were, you know, staring at your computer screens, whoever it may be. But as long as it's someone who encourages you to to keep your head up and um, I'd say find those people, especially especially in difficult if, when you find yourself in difficult roles or, um, you know, with difficult clients, whatever it may be. So I'd say those are my two big ones. Find your mentor and keep your head up. Yeah, having a support network is huge. <laughs> Um, I, so my theme is pretty similar to what Diane has been saying with, you know, confidence is key. Um, I know like most women will have doubts and second guess themselves, um, especially again to Diane's point when it's such a male dominated field, um, that can be intimidating, um, especially when you're trying to speak up or, or want to share an idea. Um, so my advice again would be, be persistent with that. Um, and keep working through those challenges. Um, continue to share your ideas and you know, be your own advocate. Um, and if you keep doing that, I mean, it might be a little uncomfortable at first, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> um, but if you keep doing that, you will start to gain respect um, of you know, your peers or your other coworkers or your male coworkers. Um, and people will, you know, they'll listen to you and they'll start working with you on it. So stay persistent and um, overcome those feelings of second guessing yourself. I'm sensing a common theme because I completely agree with what Jackie and Diane, that confidence when you're breaking into it. Um, I remember when I was graduating uh, from college in my, in my graduating class, I was one of five females who were graduating in computer science. And it was so, so hard because when I was uh, interviewing for internships, it almost seemed like every recruiter, every interviewer, they had a preconceived like level of what an engineer looked like. And 90% of the time it looked white and male. 
<laughs> as sad as that sounds, but I found the strength to proceed and become the engineer that I am today because I realized that I was living that phrase where they say, do what you love because it doesn't feel like work. Doing data work is my passion. And I feel like the more I've stuck with it, the more I learn, the more like I found my footing in this landscape. And the more that I search for doing what I love, I feel like the more opportunities have opened to me. And that's actually what led me to Epon and introduced me to Christine and Diana and Jackie and Aaron. And I feel like if you if you do what you love, all the doors will open for you. And it's cheesy, I know, but that's the biggest advice that I have. And I think it ties back into the points about confidence too, because when you feel like you're in the zone and you're doing what you want to be doing, you know, how can you not believe that that's the right thing and that you're doing it well? Um, yeah, I think they, it's a nice little, little um, self-perpetuating situation if you can get into it. Wonderful. I just want to say that I am 100% an example of what Pooja is saying, even though she's saying it's cheesy, but <laughs> I, I got to a point in my last role that it, it, I was not advocating for myself. And so I ended up doing work. I was miserable doing not what I had signed up to do. And I, and, and with a, a manager who was less than, um, he barely even spoke to me half the time, but when he did, it was not always friendly and it was not an open environment. And long story short, I, I said, this isn't, this can't be it. So I'm going to advocate for myself. And, and it did, it brought me to Epon and, um, it's been incredible. The, the, but it, it did take, you know, standing up for myself and, and saying, you know what, I'm not tolerating this. So it does happen. So, Hey ladies, this is Sandra. How's hey, everyone? Hi, Sandra. Great. Hi, Sandra. Hey, VG. Hi, I Sandra. You. I see you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, in case you weren't aware, this week is MozFest. So if anyone is not aware of what MozFest is, that's the annual Mozilla Festival. And so something important to share with this group, it started yesterday um, and it's all week. And it's literally like 12, 13 hours a day. It is just the most fantastic tech festival I, that I've attended. I, you know, try to attend every year. I try to attend as many tech festivals as I can. And especially being online during COVID, it's gotten obviously more accessible, but the content, the quality and quantity of the content has just exploded. And shout out, 90% of the content and presentations and the, um, what were some of the other, the courses, demonstrations, and there's some interactive learning experiences that you can sign up to as well. 90% of those are led by women. It was so amazing, so amazing, looking through the schedule like every day for this week and seeing that the majority, like I said, presenters and the content providers and instructors were women and fantastic, fantastic conversations. So if you have an opportunity to, the tickets are free, go sign up just so you can go see some of the content on there. And if you get a chance to actually attend any of the sessions, it would be a, a just a great boost for some of these providers and a good portion of that content is um, equality in AI, machine learning, and equality across tech. And there's a lot of data conversations, equality in data. And it was just, it was just so wonderful. So I just wanted to actually put that out there for everyone here. That if you get the opportunity, please take the time. Like I said, sign up, the ticket is free. You can donate to Mozilla but the ticket is free and there's just so much content. But also if you can't attend, everything is being recorded. 
And so you can also go listen to any of the sessions after the sessions are done. I think they post them the next day. And there's links to the YouTube channels where they have these posted. So those are out there as well. And um, thank happy, you, Sarah. Thank happy you, Happy International Women's Day, everybody. <laughs> thank Cheers. you. That's awesome, Mozilla is a really wonderful resource um, for learning things about web development. And I wasn't aware of that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, that's nice. Um, that was our last question that I had. So now it is time to open up to questions from any of y'all. Um, and I've also got a slide to put up with our names and faces and ways to get in touch with us if you want to do that. So I'll throw that up. And uh, questions are welcome um, in the chat or otherwise. Or can I ask a question of the group? I'm sure. curious, like raise hands, like how many of you, um, like let's do a peace sign if you're currently working in tech and I would like a thumbs up if you wanna move into tech. I just wanna get an idea of, of what kind of crowd we, we are hanging out with. You can throw it in the chat too, you know. And we awesome. do have a question that came in as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. So um, what advice would we give to a potential client before they reach out to a consulting firm? So that's an interesting one. Um, from the data perspective, I definitely say uh, having an idea of what all the different data points that you have are a uh, vague idea, even if you don't know how to implement it, of what kind of insights you can get from your data. Like for example, do you want um, some kind of like marketing statistics? If so, do you have um, email, email and engagement information? Do you have phone engagement information? Um, because without, without some of those key touch points, how are you going to find out how effective your marketing campaigns are if you're not, if you don't have the data for it? Um, additionally, um, making sure that you have the plan in place to at least start setting up a good data infrastructure, like Jackie mentioned, when she's talking about prioritizing the infrastructure, because once you have a good data infrastructure, everything else falls into place uh, so much more smoothly. <laughs> I definitely think that's true. And I would add to that um, understanding what consulting is and what it isn't. Um, we are, Epon is sometimes turning down work because people don't, aren't making requests that are consulting requests. Um, so making sure that you really want an advisor and you want someone to work with temporarily while you're getting something accelerated or getting something innovated, innovated. Um, but just kind of understanding the role that consultants do play on a team because it might not be um, what you've worked with before. Another question from the crowd. Thank you, Caitlin. We talked about a lot about the challenges of being a woman in tech and how to overcome adversity as a woman in a male dominated industry. What is our favorite part about being a woman in tech? I, I like being the surprise. Like Pooja was talking about, you know, you're the unique person in the room sometimes. And um, I, I like kind of breaking down those stereotypes. I don't know if I can say it better than that. <laughs> That's very similar to what I was going to say. <laughs> Talk to everybody, sorry, Jackie. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it definitely, I don't know, it feels rewarding um, being a woman in tech. 
and really like working through those things and learning how to work with people who are different than you um, and understanding how they operate and kind of adjusting what you do and using your your strengths that we talked about earlier to really make it a game changer. Looks like that resonates with the crowd. I agree, I take pride in being the only woman and keeping up with the guys. Yeah. I also, I would add to that, I think I um, enjoy the opportunity to pull others up too um, when I get the chance. Um, keeping up with the guys and showing them that not only I, but also other, other folks who look like me and act like me can keep up too. Um, you know, making that case for us. Oh, I highly, highly second the mentorship part of it. Um, I feel like I'm finally advanced enough in my career where I can start doing the same thing. And I want to start doing that more. Uh, something that's one of my goals for this year, actually, is to help somebody else do it, do what we do. I just have to third that. It's, it's huge. It's it's just incredible. It's um, just makes it makes work and work life so much better. Um, and you know, to your point, Buja, I would probably guess that you know, year or even two years ago, when you weren't as technically advanced, you probably would have killed it mentoring. Not just because because being a mentor doesn't necessarily mean you have to have all the answers, but you, I, I'm confident you would have been you would have been encouraging all sorts of women to get into tech, stick with it. There's that imposter bias talking. I still have it. I'm still trying to fight See? it. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't have to know everything to be able to make a difference and to be able to teach something to someone else because your background's different. Your experience is different. Even your encouragement is valuable, even if you're exactly the same as I'm, I'm sure we can all, all attest. I liked your question from the crowd, Diane. I'm trying to think of another one to ask everyone. Ooh. Okay, another question from the crowd. What are some things, thank you well, what are some things that actions, behaviors, or words that an ally can do to support more women in tech? It is a great question. I think asking the question means you're already on the right track. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, as someone who doesn't always say what I want to or ask my question or make my suggestion as confidently as, as I was like, because I'm questioning myself as the only woman in the group sometimes, I'd say as an ally, really listen to your female counterparts. Try to really lend a listening, even if they're speaking meekly, um, you know, just one person taking a moment to be like, oh, wait, I think she might have a really good idea here. If we just listen up, um, can make a, make a huge difference. That would be my action and behavior that I would request. Yeah. Um, one thing that I would like to also add to that is, um, you know, when you're in a meeting and a, an idea or um, suggestion is made by a woman, um, doesn't happen a lot these days. One thing I've seen is just kind of gets either ignored or overlooked um, until the same proposals made by a male counterpart. And then, you know, people are actually paying attention. Then it's situations like that where someone can actually say, oh, yeah, you know, you already pointed that out or saying something like that, because I've always felt silly saying that, oh, I just said that, you know, a few yeah. minutes back. I've always felt silly saying something like that. And, you know, I feel like someone being there as an observer to kind of point those out would have been awesome. That is such a good point. But, and I, I've seen comments, people have experienced that. I know I've experienced that probably most of the people on this call. So that's, that is, that would be huge um, for men as allies to, to kind of be the ones to point that out when it happens. Um, 
I know, and again, thinking back to like who a mentor could be, I did have one specific manager um, and he really helped me grow as a product manager. He gave me opportunities to move forward. So I think, you know, also having those mentor mentorships between men and women would be huge as well to help um, kind of strengthen that alliance. <laughs> One thing that I often hear as advice to allies is be a sponsor. And I never really understood what that meant, um, but I have had the opportunity to experience it at EPON. And I think what it means is volunteer people you know for things that are not yet in their reach or for things that they might not know are already in their reach. Um, we call this stretch your people at EPON, but um, I think it just means see potential in people and um, make decisions based on that potential because not everyone has already been given the opportunities to um, step all the way into their potential. Another good question here. Do you have any advice on how to stay confident or believe in yourself in a place where it doesn't really feel like a safe environment to make mistakes? Yeah, that's really tough. Yeah. It's, that's a really hard one. That's, that's very hard. Um, but I feel like the first step for me is the understanding that you're only human. Everybody that you work with is only human. Mistakes are a natural part of how we've evolved over the past, over centuries. Now it's it's a part, it's ingrained in human nature. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to sit down and write a piece of code or write an SQL query that's immaculate from start to finish. You can always iterate on what you've done before. You can always iterate on what you're going to do in the future. So making mistakes is almost like the best way to learn in my opinion. So you just have to become comfortable with that and, Hopefully you can find yourself in a place where making mistakes doesn't end up being a make or break. I just have to say, um, you know, whatever you can do in the meantime, while you have to be in that environment, you know, um, you, have my, you have my email address and phone number now, like reach out. But I really, really would encourage you to do what you can to find a good environment. I stuck around with my last position way too long. And it, it, was, it was really rough. And it was really rough on me mentally. And so, and it, it felt like it set me back a little bit. And so I don't want you to feel that way. Um, and so I really hope you can find a, a, safe, a safe place. And um, if there's anything any of us can do to help you do that. I'm I, there for you 100%, so. Yeah, and I think sometimes, I mean, it depends on how the environment is, but like while you're in it, try to keep in mind, you know if you're doing your best and you're working hard and you're putting your best foot forward. Um, and when, if someone's reacting to you in a certain way and, and maybe like being harsh towards any mistakes that could happen, like keep in mind that their reaction to you might not necessarily be because of your work. Um, and I think that's something, again, in the meantime, like while you're in that environment to just to stay confident and try and separate yourself from whatever their reaction is, especially if you know you're doing all the right things, you're working hard, try to separate yourself from that. Oh, I highly yeah. agree. <laughs> One final point. Um that I, that just sparked off from what Jackie said um, is that, uh, did I just lose it in the middle of the call? Oh, all right, well, maybe we can come back if I remember oh, it again. Yeah, I'll read a couple of um, insightful comments from the crowd and then we can circle back to you in the chat. Um, we've got a couple really good suggestions. Uh, one person has recently started searching for memes that they find encouraging and reading them to themselves in the morning to remind them that they're doing absolutely fine, which I love. Um, and then another one I think speaks to Jackie's point is if you don't have that in your environment, 
lean on your network outside of that space also. And it can help remind you that the issue is the environment, not you. I think that that last part, the issue is the environment, not you, is really the take home message there for sure. A question I always ask myself is if a friend was telling me what they had done and what the reaction was, what would I tell my friend? And most of the time the, the answer was like, you didn't do anything wrong. Like that's a very irrational reaction. So I always try to, I always try to think we tend to be nicer to our friends than we are to ourselves sometimes. So I use that one for work and outside of work for personal stuff too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Works like a charm. It does. It's a, it's a good question to ask for sure. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, ultimately, you need to figure out what your own self-worth is a lot of the time. So if you feel like you're in a place where you're not safe, you can't be vulnerable, you can't make mistakes, it's probably not the right place for you. Mm -hmm. I feel like we spend 90% of our days, we spend 40 hours in a week at least at work. Why would you spend all that time in the middle of your week doing something that doesn't make you happy anymore. And I think it also ties back to um, a question before this. That's another action that people can take to support women is to make it safe to make mistakes, to support anyone really, just to be a supportive work environment. Um, I think that's a really, really critical piece of it. I think we are coming right on up. Yep, it is seven o'clock. Um, I would love to invite any kind of final thoughts in the chat um, and also say thank you so very much for a wonderful evening um, if folks have to drop off. Yeah, thank you everyone um, for coming tonight. Thanks for having us. And thank you so much panelists, great job. Thank you. This is fantastic. Thanks.